like to start off by uh, welcoming Valerie Kelly from the Heritage Council. Um, the Heritage Council is the sponsor of this event, along with Gower City Council. And the event is one of the actions of the Heritage Plan. So we've had an annual conference each year for 13 years now. And we've also had a series of one day seminars. Next year, we hope to have two conferences, one on canals and waterways and the other on art history and heritage. Uh, so we'll be letting you know about the, 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 those events coming up as well. There are free uh, booklets and leaflets available on the table there. And uh, Bridget Lesham, who's one of the speakers later on, also will have some of her own books for sale. Um, so the free table is the large one there. Uh, Bridget's table, you can negotiate with Bridget <laughs> about her books. Uh, so Valerie, uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to formally open the conference and to say a few words on behalf of the Heritage Council. Give me a moment, Jim. Green Yushla, the awesome down here in Van Shot and You, done three OJ codes all the until Irak Megalieva. Um, for those of you who don't know me, like Jim said, my name is Valerie Kelly. I'm the Community and Public Engagements Officer for the Heritage Council, but much more importantly, I'm a Galway woman. So delighted to be here today. Uh, for anyone who has travelled to Galway, I promise there were two full weeks where it didn't rain. <laughs> you just missed it. <laughs> um, so I'm delighted to be here today for the 13th Annual Galway City Heritage Conference. Um, in my role in the Heritage Council, I look after the training and development of the Heritage Officer Network. So I'm really privileged that I get to witness the incredible work that our Heritage Officers do throughout the country. And this event being one of those marvellous things that, that the Heritage Officer Network have achieved over the years. And I want to express a huge thank you to Dr. Jim Higgins for arranging this and putting together what looks to be a really enlightening and invigorating day of talks and networking. Um, so without further ado, um, let's get the show on the road. Uh, and uh, yeah, lovely to see you all here. Uh, just to let you know about the, uh, the exhibitions that are around the, uh, the room. Uh, one of the exhibitions is based on the Tree Castles project that I'll be talking about later on. The Tree Castles are Terryline Castle, Menlo Castle, and the Castle in Dowishka, also known as Merlin Park Castle. And these are being conserved by Galway City Council, again with the support of the Heritage Council, with the support of the Community Monuments Fund, and uh, the City Council itself. The other exhibition then is put together by Colm O'Riordan, uh, who's going to be talking about Galway's new bridge uh, later on. Colm is a, a colleague of mine in Galway City Council, an engineer uh, who has been in charge of the project, bringing the, the whole um, Salmon Weir pedestrian walkway bridge um, in actually five weeks before time, which is probably a record for one of these modern pieces of infrastructure. In the exhibition that Column has put together, you'll also see information on some of the older waterways around Galway uh, from the 1840s and from even before that. And the amazing thing is that in the early 19th century, they were able to do things like build several bridges and several canals, probably with a lot of uh, poorly paid uh, workmen, uh, but they were able to, to do all of that in a very, very short time. Uh, so you'll see the old plan of Galway showing the, the line of the canals and the waterways as they were prior to 1840 on one of the exhibition panels down there. Our first speaker is Michael Gibbons, but uh, we, uh, oh, the very man. <laughs> well, Michael brought two things, his, his, his wonderful self and conference weather. He must, have been, he must have been fed up all week, nothing but sunshine, 
you know, beaten down on you as if it owed, you owed it money. And uh, so it's, this is conference weather. It drags people in from Salt Hill and gets them to sit down and uh, enjoy some good heritage. So the other thing that has just blown in the door as well, of course, is uh, uh, Michael himself, a uh, well-known archaeologist, tour guide, raconteur, extraordinaire, and scholar. Uh, Michael has been involved in archaeology uh, for as long as I've been involved in archaeology, which is early prehistory, shall we say. Um, in the 1970s, uh, we were in college together. Uh, Michael is, uh, was former joint director of the, the Sites and Monuments Record Office uh, in Dublin. Uh, since then, he's built up a, a massive career in tour guiding all over the world, and all over Ireland. And um, apart from that, he has a wonderful publications record and is a wonderful communicator. The title of Michael's talk is The, the Early Prehistory of the Corrib. Uh, over the last 30 years, maybe 40 years, a, a huge amount of prehistoric material has been, covered, uh, has been recovered from the river Corrib and from the lake. Uh, that has been enhanced, of course, by um, discoveries on, on roads programs in the Mycolin area. Uh, so you have this wonderful mixture of, of material that has been found by divers, that has been studied by Carl Brady, who will be speaking later on, and other material then that has been found through excavation as part of the, the, the National Roads Network. So all of these, the diving, the accidental discovery and the roadwork schemes has led to a vast amount of new information coming to, to the fore about Galway's prehistory. It used to always be thought that, you know, that the earliest evidence for people in Galway was the late Mesolithic, the late Middle Stone Age. But now, of course, that has all been pushed back uh, immensely by the new discoveries and the ongoing discoveries. So, over to you, Michael. Gee, Bermatson. Some cohorts. More visa. Good visa. By my chance, a new friend, Chance Stars, can't a shot. He got a share of father that we have the Ocht Meal of Lingokin. On special control. So, I'll be talking about the early history of, of this region. And it's a region that I got to. Explore when I was a young scholar under Professor Etienne Rain, um, and later under Professor John Waddell, with his rigorous attention to uh, context. And the late Tom Fanning, of course, also who was a, a tremendous scholar. So we had a great, tiny little department, but uh, full of very interesting characters, often fighting with each other. And, uh, you know, science progresses not through agreement, but through discord. You know, if we all agree, we'd, we'd get nowhere. And so I've been um, lucky enough to be in various places. I worked for the Museum of London for a while, incredible, rigorous scholarship there. I worked for the Department of Antiquities in Jerusalem for a while. And I've uh, done some work in the Aegean for a while. But the most important job I had, I suppose, was I directed with Geraldine Stout, the Sites and Monuments Record Office, who so helped me to see the whole country from Waterford to Donegal, quite literally and worked on the Galway survey throughout mostly Connemara and the islands. But I've spent time on the Carib as well. And the Carib is an incredible waterway. It stretches all the way from here to Mam. It's linked in with a bigger water system that goes all the way up into central Mayo. So an exceptional. So when did the first people come to Ireland? Well, we know they came about 1,600 years later than they, our neighbours in Britain. And we've had episodic Paleolithic settlement into Britain, or going back almost 700,000 years. We have four artifacts from Ireland from the Paleolithic, all in from, from not secure context. So the oldest one, or one of them, is from Dunangasa, found by um, what was termed an English archaeologist, young English guy, and that was treated with great suspicion at the time because of that, by Damon Murphy. But actually he was from County Loud. He just immigrated as a 12-year-old to England. And I, I, I've met him and spoke to him about it. So there's a Paleolithic axe, it's the first item in the National Museum, if you go and do go. 
It's a very interesting artifact. And more recently, of course, this artifact published by Marion O'Dowd, suggesting a pre-Mesolithic, short-lived perhaps, uh, episode of human contact in this west coast here, in a, a window after the end of the last Ice Age, which ended, of course, in this area about 15,000 years ago. And Ireland becomes an island about 14,000 years ago, roundabout. It's not specific. And uh, there's a delay then before we have any good evidence. But that evidence then comes in buckets and spades. But so our settlement history is different from mainland Europe in lots of ways, different from Britain, but there were huge numbers of archaeologists and field clubs going back there. So in part it's to do with who's looking at the landscape. That's, that's what you're looking at and what you're finding. And we can see that very early with the Mesolithic with Professor Woodman's great work all around Ireland. And the glacial history, of course, decides what was left to us because it scoured out the landscape numerous times over the last million years. So you're always left with a sort of patchy, patchy evidence. It's full of holes. If you're looking for a straight line answer in archaeology, there isn't one. It's gaps and holes, and we try to put a narrative together. We should be putting a continuous one because we don't have a continuous record. But it's a record that's growing through the works of the Archaeological Survey and lots of field archaeologists and so on. So we have this amazing new discoveries off our west coast because of the Inframar program and the mapping projects offshore, the deep shore mapping of our glacial history, which again will have a huge impact long term, we think. Doggerland, this drowned landscape of the North Sea, really, really old Europe. And when Britain was connected with Europe, uh, and remain connected after the break with Ireland. Um, so these are where the first big migrations into Britain happened after, say, 12,000 years ago. So you have lots of material in all over Britain from around 12,000 years ago. There's a delay then, the sort of stop to take one look at the Dublin Mountain and say, we've had enough. We're not crossing. So we have a couple of hints that Bear Patel have been one of them, that there might have been people here, but it's it's disputed, and then one artifact, one swallow doesn't make a summer, but it just might. So it's very, very interesting. So Doggerland is here, and Ireland and then is off to the west, and much of our landscape in the south is drowned. In the north, it's uplifted. So the south of Ireland, our early landscapes are literally underwater. If you buy the recent Archaeology Ireland article, I have an article on the megalithic tombs of Cork, the ones underwater. Um, so anyway, I'll show you them. And of course, Ireland and Britain are, and have been tied at the hip for millennia. And so we have similarities and differences. And you can see how close we are to the Antrim coast. I was up there two weeks ago and you were looking at houses shining on Kintyre. You could see Isla to the north. Here. So, you know, and we're of course in the south from, Cor from uh, Cornwall and Pembrokeshire in Wales, you're a day's sail across to Wexford. So a large canoe with a sail on it would have got you here in a day, weather con conditions and so on. So it's not, and of course, these are these, uh, these are just I wish these slides of the glacial history of the West. So the Carb Basin and the whole area east and west were massively influenced by these huge drumland fields that we get. And we have drowned landscapes. So how do you know the landscape? So, it's very good to be a skeptic if you're a historian or an archaeologist. Skepticism is what science is based on. And this is a really interesting site. We don't know what day it is. It's floating in time and space. It's near Ballyvahan. It's part of a drowned landscape. It's a series of cairns along the shore. Now, maybe there are ballasts being brought across to Connemara, but they're in a kind of awkward spot to get a decent boat in. So there's a line of cairns there. So again, we're not sure what date this is. Uh, or a little bit more secure date down here. This um, trackway, well, we, I thought it was a trackway, more likely now possibly a full of the fear down at Lippa. Now, this was found below high water mark um, and excavated by the underwater unit. And you've got these trackway, and we found similar features elsewhere in Connemara. So that's showing Galway Bay is much um, wider and bigger than it was, even in its latest 2000 BC. And we're starting 10,000 years ago, so today is, is 4,000 years ago. So we have drowned landscapes. So that meant the carob system was very different. The river was exiting onto the shore of Goa Bay much further out than it is now. So that's implications for dredging operations later. 
Line the post. This is a line of post, double line. If you can see them, they're running up at the beach at Lethagesh, which I came across after the storm 2014. I went back the next day to measure them. They had vanished under darling stones. The, the seas were still very powerful. It's probably, it may or may not be there. So, so we have evidence. And this little one, it's on Balnick Hill Bay. Uh, a little stone row on the shore. Uh, again, stone rows from 1000 BC, roughly. These are rough dates I've given you now. Don't be pulling me up later saying I got 100 years wrong. But anyway, Balnick Hill. So we have good evidence of sea level rise, of course, on the area here. And you have this massive contrast on the car between the igneous rocks to the west and the limestones, sedimentary rocks. To the east. So it's a very sharp divide, uh, a cultural divide also in a, in a way, um, between the two areas here, west and east. And then if you look at the photograph, it shows up very nicely the shallowness of Galway Bay. That shallowness even more emphasized when you look at this informal <coughs> data set here. You can see way out to the west, Canton and Nilon. Uh, this is a group of islands, beautiful, amazing group of islands. Aaron, you can see, with the extension of Aaron underwater in the yellow. So 10,000 years ago, these islands were twice the size perhaps they are now with deep channels between them. And Galway Bay, inner Galway Bay, much of it from here all the way across to uh, Kinvari, there was tidal streams with no continuous sea probably. And one of the lovely little axes, and we're finding these now quite a number. I was talking to a guy from the National Museum yesterday who confirmed two, two of these that we found. Um, one from the far end of Inish Gort Island, that's south of west of Inish Baffin. But this one is from Kun Kashin. The Baba Jack O'Connell, a dredge of Tlushni, Gos Corblino, and he's Captain Anilan. Share the beyond. Ah, go, clock to a horn, and Christopher listen to the Well, shut the can on one John Baba Jack was dredging, reclusioning, small little light, uh, scallops, and he dredged up two polished stone axes. And he couldn't find the other one, but after 40 years, he found this one in the shed. And it's a shale axe, but very important information on the level of sea level rise. So this is important in terms of where we're looking at the carb system. So the hunter-gatherer system, a delay of getting into Ireland by 15, 1600 years perhaps, and then a population movement across, and possibly for Northern France as well. The specific transit points aren't there, are known because we have very little evidence of burials. But we have Mount Sandal, the Northern East Coast of Ireland was very popular because that's where all the field archeologists were, the Belfast naturalists, Field Club were pioneers in Irish archaeology. And then later on, Peter Woodman, as he moved south, he found Mesolithic material down there. The Mesolithic followed him because he's a good eye for it. And, and then more recently, Ferter's Cove in the very southwest and Beldurig in the northwest. And of course, at this time, there's a forested world, um, oak and pine initially, oak later. But we have fish traps from the, the earliest monuments we have up to now have been fish traps. At Clownanstown and County Mead in the middle of Dublin city itself, down near the point, if you're ever wandered on that way, very important fish traps discovered during monitoring. And of course, we have fish traps still in use in Connemara. This is one from a really interesting site at Loch Ivenine, where they're still using a fish trap. If you see the men working on it, this is a Mesolithic way of life, hidden in plain sight. That's a bicycle wheel. But the spokes take it out using discarded um, nets and a canalized stream that's been deliberately canalized and lined with white stones to, to show that sea up the stiffenines, as they're called. The stiffenines are these lovely fish here. They're like anchovies. They're sand smelt. Huge fishery. And we found another one of these further west. So you have a hunter-gatherer population. And of course, foraging along the sea has been hugely important. Stranded seals, stranded whales, probably. Eel was a big part of the diet. And the big salmon. If you look at the map of Goa, 1650s, that lovely map of Goa, the size of the salmon there, they're using tridents to stick them. So fish trapping would have been very important. And so Goa City, where it's located, is at this incredible interface between the incredible the lowlands to the east, the mountains and granite lands to the west, and this incredible marine landscape to the south. So one of the one of the most important 
location. Very similar to Limerick City, if you like, another similar city. In, and Sligo, Sligo gets its name from shellfish. So, you know, you have key ecosystem of the exploited. Some of the earliest Mesolithic sites, this is what they look like. That's why we haven't found any. <laughs> <laughs> this is a tiny little Mesolithic spear, a tiny little, these are microliths. The very early Mesolithic, they're, they're unbelievably detailed, uh, fine working. Uh, I've never found an early Mesolithic artifact. And that's why, because you need good eyes for them. Now, Jim hasn't either, so he's found just about everything else on the planet. But uh, it's a very, and we, these are in Ireland from very early on, but we haven't yet to find them. The road schemes near Ballinasloe Slow actually found some early Mesolithic material. Very interesting. So we have flyby. Burials are as rare as hen's teeth. This is a burial site, very important by, by um, Tr Tracy and Frank Collins. Um, at Hermitage, and this is one of the most important sites ever found in Ireland, near Castle Con again on a situation very like Galway is now, the junction of a major river system, the Shannon, a fording point on the river, so like a totem pole with an axe and cremation burials in it. So a hugely significant crossing point. And where we find the prehistoric stuff in Galway is in similar locations to this. And of course, Galway, you're looking north onto the river, and of course, you're looking at the river as it is now. It's narrower than it was. This is looking up from Jordan's Island. Are there any Baptists here? Jordan's Island gets its name from the Anabaptist sect that was here in the 17th century. Cromwell, as you know, was an incredibly uh, plaholic man. He allowed all sorts of heretical groups to emerge. He didn't like Catholics so much, but everyone else was fine. Quakers and Shakers and Baptists and Anabaptists. Anyway, Jordan's Island was one of those islands. But all along that area here, you have or did have a whole much wider river with lots of paleo lakes associated with it, are now bogs adjoining it. And of course, this is our first map of Galway. Uh, the Carob, as you see, very interesting, quite a bit of woodland between my Colin and further up in Tokterard at the narrow neck, Coshan and the Kirke up in near Glan, also in the Cornamona side running over to Kong, and over near Cross also, significant woodland still surviving here in the 1590s. And Galway City before the River Carb was straightened and drained as it did massively in the 19th century. But this is a real snapshot. This is Galway as, as Ireland is about to change from the Elizabethan moral comes charging in on top of everyone else. But so these are, so from early map sources, we can see the Carb changing. The Annals of the Four Masters, well worth reading, by the way. Four volumes. I have a copy. I got this out of it last night. The River Gallium was dried up for a period of natural day. All the artifacts that had been lost in from the remotest times as well as its fish were collected by the inhabitants of the fortress and by the people of the country in general. So it's dry. It's a, remember, it's a great, it's much wider. There's shoals. Cahar Bungalov is built. The town here is built on a series of tidal streams that's running under the city. So great spot for... Uh, for fish traps and so on, and passes across it. And it's a Lockheed 1191, so not too far later, better weather. Uh, early example of global warming. River got have dried up this year, and there was a hatchet found in it, measuring one hand from one point to the other, and there was a spear found in it, measuring three hands, three fingers in breadth, and a hand from the shoulder and the end. So it was part of a bog body here as well. So this is a very interesting account. Now, the big impact on the carb, as we know, was the carb navigation scheme and the massive draining works that took place all the way up here into the mass. 1840-52, scheme by the Board of Works. Small number of artifacts were found, and they were commenting the reason there were so few found is that there were so many found in the 12th century. But of course, the reason was that found. There was no one looking at there at the time when the spiral was coming up. 1954 Additional draining works, small amounts found. But again, there was nobody there with knowledgeable eyes looking at it. So you have a history of the car, but lots of material. And of course, that is the context for, oh, I'm sorry, this is just southwest of Anna Down. You can see, if I can show it, you see the lines? So there's a huge cut from the bottom right up to the middle and spile heaps either side. So this was a huge drainage effort uh, during the 1840s and through the famine years. Digging, making a channel navigable all the way up to Kong to open up the interior for trade. The age of canals was still here. 
the age of Ray was pulling into it shortly afterwards. And we're finding in dry spells, this is up uh, near Cornamona, uh, other features, little causeways running out to small islands. They're not cranogs, we're not sure what they are. So the low water levels are, are still revealing material, including stone axes. These are very important initiatives that was taken by a group of divers, the Griffins, Padro Dowd on the right, very familiar to everyone here. And look at the collection of material that they have here. Now this is just collected and was unrecorded, sadly. A lot of it went unrecognized due to its importance at the time. And I remember, when we, I think it was Peter Woodman came up. Uh, no, it was um, Michael Ryan came and gave a lecture on the Mesolithic. But look, in the middle of all of this, you have everything from medieval swords, medieval spear points, Bronze Age swords, and a whole heap of early Mesolithic, or Mesolithic and early Neolithic material. So an incredible diverse material. And there was hundreds of these, and they were found between Menlo, uh, just south of Menlo. So there's, a, there's one of the richest probably archeological zones in the country, and uh, one that would really repay, uh, you know, a really in intensive focused research project on the the carb just north of Galway City. Some of the dated sites, we have got dated sites now. Fenor to the south, Michael Lynch's wonderful work down there, late Mesolithic, so that's pre-farming between six and 7,000 years ago. Uh, we have a date from Renville with no, no context, very far north, again, later Mesolithic. And we have two very important sites, one found by Jim, sorry, both of them found by Jim, uh, at the Owen Rift River, who has a has a 17 year old or maybe 16 year old at the mouth of the Owen Rift River. Now, how many people in Ireland would have recognized a band flake at that time? Well, one of them was up here, Jim Higgins. Later, near Hedford, in when the Antashka were putting in, in the Turlock, a little a little um, bird hide, another Mesolithic artifact was found there, another band flake in a Turlock system where large flocks of birds would have been coming in winter, perfect hunting ground for people in tune with the natural world. So mesolithic material, there's some mesolithic material in that last slide in and around Galway Bay. And now we're picking up some further west with two recently dated mesolithic middens from Connemara. One touch Connon, the slide is a bit rough. This is Connon male was the buffoon or sort of comic figure when the Finn McCool's army. The Yachan Chirivic Thredge, he never stood back from a fight. But he was fighting with a Kalyuk from Clare, and they were throwing stones back and over at her. And if a Kalyuk who's Kalyuk is used to throwing stones, and she always you should never throw one back because the battle go on all day. But during the battle between the Kalyuk from the burn and Conan Muel, he bent down to pick up. He just had a he just been on the shore collecting shellfish, and he bent down to pick up another stone, and his pockets broke and a big mound of shell emerged. So we have a fantastic piece of Shanachas recorded about this site. Touch Conon, but we've got a date from it, from 6,000, almost 6,000 BC. I think it's the earliest surviving, and that was one date, but it's the earliest monument in the Irish landscape on the coast of Kosharaga, just to the east of here. So there's people in and around Galway Bay, and they're there because it's rich environment for hunter-gatherer groups and no richer than Galway City itself. This is a fantastic <coughs> discovery up here by a man whose family are from Camus, but it's Aidan McDonough. It was in low water. They were checking the boats, the car princess, when the river was very low and they were looking for, and they found this is, again, it's a minor point. I'm not quite sure of the word. Like a little spearhead points on either end from a type site on, in, in, in Mead, fantastic lake dwelling that the late John Bradley excavated. We'll find them down off Castle Town Bear, the Castle Towns, Castle Town, Castle Towns Bear, sorry, in Cork, and in Roscommon also. So these are Mesolithic artifacts. We're not really sure how they worked, but there's one now from literally near Minlow Castle, a very important artifact. Again, showing you the importance of this. These are some more of these minor points. Uh, similar ones are found recently at Belderig and a very crude one at, um, at Fenor, where Michael Lynch was uh, excavating. Uh, so these are very significant artifacts. And, and this, uh, Elizabeth Moylan on the right, 
She comes in to you one day and she says, I think I found something interesting. And it's a mud stone axe. I said, Elizabeth, you've ruined my day, my week, my years, decades looking for them. I've been 35 years looking for any sort of an axe. I'm terrible about finding artifacts. And uh, a week later, her niece came in, Lorna Mylan, found another one. This is after the 2014 storm in Karna, a subsea site, probably later Mesolithic, pushed up onto the shore. We're literally field walking the shore for debris from the storm surge. There was a great history of plastic there as well. If anyone wants to do a PhD on the early history of plastic. But these are two rough out axes from Fenor. And so Fenor is an axe factory. Doolin is an axe factory. That area, a band of shale, actually. It's, rather, it's actually shale. It's not mudstone. And they're traded throughout the West and into the carb systems. Nearly all the axes here are, looks like they're coming from West Clare, from this bed of shale. Anyway, those are, there's uh, the two. And these are eyes like hawks. Don't be fooled. They're actually razor sharp. I walked over an axe. I said, Michael, you, you forgot this one here. I, said, I, didn't see I didn't see it. These are some of the artifacts coming up now from the Connemara coast in an intertidal zone. These are from Carob, uh, more recent finds. I think Jim would publish these. Uh, the ground stone axis. So these are from the very early history of, of the Carob system. And you're getting them all the way up into Dlan um, also from finds there recently. So the Paleo Lake, one of the more interesting sites is a lovely man. I was giving a lecture in Corindola and a man came up to us who had found uh, a number of artifacts. So this is, Anna down here is in the middle. You see it? Uh, where the famous abbey is. And there's a Thorn and Wassa. There's a, a fantastic, what well, was a Paleo Lake, a part, an extension of the lake is now a bog. And um, this artifact was found in it. Uh, uh, what's, what's his first name? Hesham, uh, Jimmy Hesham, really sharp eyed. And this is a stone axe, but the stone axe was decorated on both sides. Really, very, very interesting artifact. One of the artifacts from my column also has what were considered scratch marks, but they're not scratch marks. If you look at the detail in some of this, these are not stones. Uh, we're not quite sure what they mean, but there's someone altering the axe. Look at this one here. So this is in a bog under the bog, at the edge of the bog in the marl. And these uh, bogs are now, there's a hole, the river, you have to think of the carb system has been much bigger, extending eastward and in various embayments that are now uh, local bogs. So this is one of the very interesting artifacts from the paleo carb, I'm stretching the carb now a little bit east, but not that far east. There are parallels for them, but in a vague sense from Stark Har, which is a famous Mesolithic site east of England from around 10,000 10, years ago. We have very fine engravings and similar, similar to this. But you also have this site, Lehman Sagart in, in Cork. This is the incredible Bully site down in Cork, but within it and unrelated to the Bully is a series of very detailed uh, carvings and drawings that in their form look at least superficially like the carved axe. This is what early Mesolithic looks like. I, mean, I knew that would get you excited. These are leaf-shaped arrowheads from um, various places. Well, well County Antrim. So these are your classic band flakes. And these are the ones, there's at least one in that photograph from the 1980s with the divers. Jim has found two of them. Um, Jared Hessian from Cladidup found one in Topside that he got from a neighbor. It's from just opposite Omi Island, Honey Flint. He said, it's ancient. I said, how do you know it's ancient? Been a good skeptic. He says, it's worked all around the age and it's flint. I said, what color is it? He said, it's honey colored. I said, what shape is it? He said, it looks like a big leaf. I said, I'll be out in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> he described precisely. He get a, he gets a, he gets a 100% in the exam. A band flake. That's in the National Museum now, but um, it should be in Galway because it's a beautiful artifact. It's one of these. <clears throat> so a typical site. Now, fascinating about the Mesolithic, when the first people moved into Ireland 10,000 years ago, the first confirmed good evidence that we have people, maybe someone before, they don't allow anyone in after that. 
They say, thanks, we're here now. And what a disappointment. There's no cattle, there's no horses, no sheep. Oh, for God's sake, why do we bother? So they have to make do with the environment they have with no large mammals. That's what makes Ireland very different. So that the fisheries are a huge part and part of that. So these artifacts are band flakes, very significant. And we have, these are some of the prehistoric middens. As you can see, uh, the one in blue is Fenor further down. Uh, <coughs> I should have a yellow dot there. From Tut Conon, just short of 6,000 BC. Another one from Clifton Bay, 4,000 BC. And the Barn of Boat, of course, very significantly, is an early Neolithic boat in an intertidal but peatland environment, a lake environment that was later swamped by rising seas. These are some of the middens that I did a, a survey a few years back, just a rough survey of the East Galway, East Galway Bay coastline. These are incredibly rich oyster beds. Some of them are hundreds of meters across. The rat, um, and in Canberra Bay, one of them is 300 meters long. It's a, you can see it on the satellite imagery, it's that big, and it's two meters deep. If you go to Canberra and look west. So this was a rich environment, rivers running in, a lovely soup of fresh water and salt water, perfect for oysters. But the early middens tend not to be oyster middens, they tend to be periwinkle middens, interestingly. Whether the oysters had developed there or not, but what they look like is, um, there is an oyster midden uh, found, forming the foundation of a stone wall, and these are like concrete. This is a, a Colleen O'Driscoll's wonderful work in, again in the Maori Peninsula. He found some late, mostly Neolithic, early Bronze Age, but some Mesolithic material also. This is Fenor, the early excavation that Michael Lidge did. Again, following the storm surge there, he did really amazing work here in that Doolin. And this was an axe factory that was published years ago. The Doolin Axe Factory by the Limerick Field Club, I think it was. So these axes are Ferreter's Cove. Lovely, lovely place. Peter Woodman worked there. Again, a small find in the shoreline. He carried out a big excavation there. Later, Mesolithic population here. And one cow. So one cow, possibly a pioneering agricultural group that made it across from France. Or else, which was more likely, I think, a cow that got washed in in a big flood and made its way to West Kerry. But last, Hunter's first farmers. So it's one of the very interesting sites. Belderig is something similar to that. That uh, Warren, he's a, he's a professor in, in UCD, is an incredible worker. The site that was found by, by, by um, James Coffin's dad. Where is your Neolithic around the Carib? Well, there's plenty of it, but it's not far, it's hard to find. This is just outside Cam, Clun Marov, fantastic court job. How many here has ever been at it? Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> The reason it's hard to find, it's in the middle of a woodland and it's break your heart trying to find it. But it's a fantastic Neolithic site. Well, that's a bit far from Galway. And I know you don't travel that well. But the Minlo portal tomb, I'm sure everyone here has seen it. How many people here have seen the Minlo portal tomb? Excellent. Three. <laughs> and the reason you haven't seen it, this is what it looks like. We thought the, the Clunmaro tomb was hard to find. This is an incredible site, but it's very important. Why is it important? It's where it is. It's early Neolithic, 3700 BC, but it's overlooking a paleo channel. So the modern channel that you go up, the Friars Cut, was cut by the Office of Public Works in 1842. But the older channel hugs right Minlo village, and it goes right up, leaving the big bog west of it. So this is right next to that. So we have these paleo channels in the peatlands that's now around the bog at uh, the lower Carrow. And a very important recent excavation from the inner rain. What good do they do? Well, they do fantastic work on road schemes all over the country. And a very interesting site here from an early Neolithic settlement site, the oldest one dated, certainly west of the Carrow, 3700 BC at Ballykirk Lake on the bypass just southeast of Mike Holland. They found two charcoal pits, you see up the top, another one down near pit with Neolithic pottery, carnated bowl, the earliest type of pottery, it's coarse pottery, early Neolithic, very important. Again, Valley Crook Lake would have been part of the larger Paleo Lake of Loch Carob. And very interesting, the botanical work here that Karen Malai has done is quite spectacular. Again, you can see the land them arriving, 
the Ellen decline, the whole clearance of the forest coinciding with the first farmers here. Now, one of the little, uh, and in her pollen diagram, she has evidence for a uh, frequent burning in the later Mesolithic. So lots of charcoal particles immediately before 6,000, so between six and 7,000 years ago. And she says that it's, uh, it's probably natural from natural fires. No, it's not. These artifacts were found next to it, but out of context. The archaeologists consider them to be Neolithic on the basis that they were 20 meters from the Neolithic pits. Now, there was also a Coca-Cola can <laughs> nearby and an early Christian pit. So proximity doesn't date anything. You have to have secure context. So there's a good chance these could be Mesolithic as opposed to Neolithic. Because you just can't say because one is next to the other that they're anyways related. Because the Mesolithic is 4,000 years long. It's the largest period in our history. So it's why it's worth having a little talk about it. So the Paleo Channel, just to show you one of them. This page can work. I don't know. There. That's the Paleo Channel. So that's one of the... That's another one. And this is the friar's cut. But it's, if you look how strange it is, it's not cut by friars. It's cut by machinery in 1842 by a huge program. And this is a very nice map as well. French Admiralty chart, an attempt by the French to liberate us. They failed. Just to don't remember your 17th century history. But these are some of the new finds. And of course you have a whole architecture of sacred mountains, probably Neolithic. When you're on the lake, you're looking up. You have Nakma, Tanakma, Trihina, Tanakma, Trihina, Tanakma, Trihina. If you had fairies in your house, that's how you got rid of them. Knock Maz on fire, knock Maz on fire, knock Maz on fire. Fairies would flee out of your house, go back. Knock Maz a citadel, built up complex of probable passage zones between Hedford and the lake, visible very obviously from the lake. This is Cairn Seafin, just west of Octorard, overlooking the upper carb, incredible location. And it's looking across onto Mount Cable or Binge Leave, which is here. That's been, there's a tomb there, first recorded by William Wilde. And there's another one there, that's Cairn Seafen. And so Knock Man's off to the left, there's a couple of little cairns, but they're probably Bronze Age ones further down. So they have a whole sort of ritual landscape from the lake and all these credible islands that you have in it. And down here, you have uh, the city of Galway, which has moved its focus up and down this river. And that river has shrank since the Mesolithic as the sea level has risen but it has been a central place in the history of this area, uh, not represented so much by the surviving monuments other than the portal tombs, but certainly by the huge volume of material culture that divers and local people and various scholars have found over the years. Thank you very much. <laughs>